right. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit about my background. My um, uh, my wife of 30 and best friend of 38 years um, has been and, and still is very instrumental in broadening my knowledge base. Um, I originally started out my working career after getting out of college in the electronics technology business. I found a niche in the biomedical industry. Um, worked in that field for 30 years total. Um, I met my wife while I was working for the first company I worked for. Um, I became a field rep for a biomedical company that was worked at, that operated out of Miami, Florida. I was a field rep out of uh, the, their branch office was in Beltsville, Maryland. I didn't meet my wife right then, but as I worked in that industry for a while, I became um, a, a, from a general, I went from a generalist to a specialist. This company was pretty huge in the, in the hospital, laboratory, clinical environment, research facility business. And they created equipment that all of these laboratories used. Uh, my wife's degree is in medical technology. Um, I found myself working um, in that territory and expanded that territory to, for everything east of the Mississippi and from the Canada, from Canada all the way down to the Gulf. Uh, so I did a lot of air travel. Um, I got a call from one of the R&D guys that was in Miami that, you know, we had a piece of equipment that was in its infancy. And they developed a, a product that a lot of hospitals bought. I think at, at total one time we had almost 500 pieces of equipment. These are half million dollar pieces of equipment that's installed in each of these facilities. The call that I received was um, kind of a crisis call that a hospital in Evansville, Indiana, a Deaconess Hospital, which is where my wife did her internship after college, um, she worked on this piece of equipment. And um, um, she and uh, the rest of the crew there at the laboratory, and they're all med techs, uh, were having a lot of difficulty with this piece of equipment. So I found myself going from Evans from Baltimore, D.C. to Evansville to Miami, back and forth for almost 10 months. Every week I was doing this run. So I had to understand at that point from the MedTech's perspective as to what was going wrong with it. And she was very instrumental in giving me a lot of information that I was passing back and forth to uh, the engineers on the project and all that. So, with that being said, we um, developed a social relationship, and, and then, of course, when uh, the company got so big, we moved to, uh, they, they closed the office in Beltsville, and they asked me, well, where do you want to go? You've got an office to lead up either in Atlanta or Edison, New Jersey, and I asked them, is this a trick question? Because Edison wasn't even in the hunt. For me, and I've been coming back and forth to this area, and I love this area. This is my home. This is where I'm going to live out the rest of my days. Is here. I love this area. So, um, with that being said, again, like I said before, some of which that I'm going to talk about here initially is going to seem really off the reservation, but but just bear with me for a second. Some of this is going to come to fruition or, or come to clarity when. Uh, after I get through about two or four slides. Can anybody tell me what this is? Red blood cell. Red blood cell. Erythrocyte. Red blood cell, red blood core puzzle, they're all the same. It's a very unique cell in our human body. There's not an animal on earth that doesn't have this in their bloodstream. <clears throat> they're characteristically the same. Uh, their way they're shaped, they're, they're, they have no nucleus. It's, it's, it's in this shell of this cell embodies a protein called hemoglobin. Each cell is designed for two purposes. One is to feed the body oxygen, or O2, and remove carbon dioxide. That's what it's designed to do. For a healthy human being, there, uh, in males, there's uh, five to six million of these cells per microliter, and on a female, it's four to five million 
uh, cells per microliter. So the surfaces of these of these cells are maximized to capture as many binding sites for heat for uh, oxygen as it, it, as can be be done, and that allows the process to uh, your body is going to implement a circulation of these cells from the lung, from the heart to the lungs, all the way and circulate throughout the entire body. It feeds the cells, it takes away the carbon dioxide by allowing the cells are allowed to, uh, uh, for the CO2 to bind and bring them back to the lungs in order for you to breathe out or exhale that, that product. Um, you have to excuse the, the writing on this. this I, I got this off of a, uh, a UK website. They, they spell it that way. The A is not pronounced. It's hemoglobin, H-E-M-O. But anyway, you can see the size of the cell is very small. Uh, the volumetric measurement on typically these cells is anywhere from 91 to 94 cubic microns. Very small. And if you understand the size of this, it's you can't see this without a microscope. So, but in addition to binding with um, oxygen and, and CO2, there are other gases that are out there. Now, in a, in a normal breathing atmosphere, we're at um, about one-fifth of, of it is oxygen and the remainder part of it is nitrogen. Now, one may ask, well, can you live with just oxygen? Because the majority is, is, is uh, of the air we breathe is nitrogen. The answer to that is kind of complex, but the, answer, the basic answer is yes, you can. Unfortunately, nitrogen is another component that we breathe in that helps aid in, in hair growth, nails, and also gives us the opportunity for our organs to, to be nourished as well, too. Trace elements. Uh, one that is missing out of all of this is CO, and that's a component that we all breathe in. This room has a certain amount of CO in it, and I'll tell you that I'll tell you about that in a second. the The insidious portion of this particular process is that CO is more than 200 times efficient at binding to hemoglobin molecules than oxygen is. And when it competes with this, it drives, it makes the CO, uh, the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels, it, it, it has no space left for it. It drives them out. And it stays in those cells for a long period of time. So has anybody ever, uh, dealt with or uh, know of anybody that's ever been uh, had an issue with CO poisoning. You seen it? It's not a pretty sight. Yeah. It is not a pretty sight. I had an opportunity, um, I found myself, when I was working in Baltimore, I found myself going up to Harrisburg and uh, to get to the lab at Harrisburg General you had to go through the ER room. And while I was walking in, they were bringing in a trauma patient, an old man who all they, you know, he was covered up. He would have a breather mask on and he was pink all over his hair. I didn't know what was going on, you know, as, as you know, naive as I was at the time. I figured, you know, the guy's having a heart attack. Well, come to find out, when I got to the lab, the, the, um, folks there were running around trying to gather up a bunch of, because they also draw blood at that point, and the only way to know just how toxic an individual is, and by the way, this wasn't the picture of that guy. This is, if you had CO poisoning, your whole face would be pink. I mean, in a severe case. But they were running around trying to get all the sticking needles and syringes and everything put together on a, on a crash cart that they could take to the ER. So they got a, 
they, they uh, received an order, a stat order, from the ER physician to come in and draw a, an arterial stake, which, by the way, if anybody's ever had one of those, those darn things are painful. But in order to get it to an artery, you have to actually go in. It's not a venous stick, you know, where you can, you know, you almost don't even feel them. Somebody who sticks really well, and my wife does, by the way, too. Uh, the first time she ever stuck me was when I, after I met her, and I didn't feel a thing. But an arterial stick, you have to go deep <laughs> in, and as soon as you get a vein, you turn the needle and you, and you ride it. Yeah. So if any of you ever have to have one done, you kind of be prepared. But an arterial stick is one that where, where they do a what's called a blood gas test. Um, in this particular case, it's called, uh, today's standards, it's called a, carby, a carby hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin test. And, um, but in, in the early days, a lot of the equipment was pretty rudimentary. And you had to do a lot of calculations and things like that. And what the carboxyhemoglobin test does is look at the ratio between hemoglobin and CO. So when, they, when, the, when the tech came back to the lab with that, that filled syringe, it was completely red. It was fire engine red. And I've seen enough venous sticks to know what the color difference is. It's a deep dark red and a venous stick and bright red on an arterial stick, but this was like super red. And one of the texts mentioned to the other, you should have seen this guy. He was, his whole body from waist up to where she saw was all pink. And, you know, again, if any of you have ever seen somebody suffocate, you know, the general principle of suffocation is you can't take a breath. This is even worse, much worse. So I cannot impress upon you all enough as home inspectors. You've got to be aware of these types of things that can produce CO in houses. There's so many telltale signs. I know you all have stories of things that you've seen, but I'm going to show you a few photos here in a second. My wife's, I got these numbers from my wife the other day on the normal ranges and the critical uh, range. And the normal ranges, even though it says, well, you know, how can any amount of CO in the body be good? Well, the, the 0.5 to 5 is a well-star range. You know, there's some organizations that may have slightly different ranges, but they all kind of put together a, a set of ranges that are developed by the pathologist in each lab. But a five, if somebody comes in with a four point something, that, that is not a critical event. You know, if you're, you're walking down the street and with traffic running, you're breathing the car, the, you know, the spent fuels from vehicles and all that, you're going to have a, a, a range closer to a five than you would a point one. But it's when you get beyond 15, and the 15% range and above is when things get really serious. So, um, as we do inspections, um, you know, again, we need to be vigilant about identifying markers, sources, issues that pertain to combustion vents and things like that. So um, keep also in mind, too, that I, I don't know if this patient up at Harrisburg General, because they had to fly him out. Um, I found out later on that they flew him to Einstein uh, General in Philly because they didn't have a, um, a hyperbaric chamber. Because what they do on a patient who's, who suffers from this, or is suffering from this, they have to put him on O2, I mean like 95% plus O2 in a chamber, and they strip him down naked and they, they try to get his body completely saturated with O2 in order to try to release these, binding, these CO binding sites. That's the only way you can bring somebody back. On average, 400 patients per year never make it out of the 20,000 that come through the ER. So um, it's, it's a pretty concerning issue with a lot of folks, especially in the medical community and, and, and points up north where in winter, you know, you have people running space heaters and, and like and, um, and all of that, you, and, and running fireplaces and, and so forth that, 
if there, those are sources of issues. Anyway, um, CO is not just the amount, it's the exposure. It's the time that you're exposed to the CO. Um, you have different levels, and as you can see, the OSHA standard is anything above, anything below 50 parts per million in any one given eight hour period is acceptable. And then as you go up, you start seeing that time. As you go up in the amount of parts per million, you see the time starts to decrease until you, you have issues where this gas can become lethal. And that's where the danger comes in. On, on this, so um, kind of be aware of that. Um, don't take anything that you see um, lightly. You know, when you see something like this, and again, be you can write it up, but don't set the alarm bells off. It it just needs to be looked at by a professional, by a life, preferably a licensed professional. And in this particular water heater, I took this picture of. You know, CO basically is a, uh, a gas that is caused by uh, uh, improper or inadequate fuel utilization of a, of a gas fire appliance. So when you're, when you're seeing something like this, you can note it in your reports, but make a recommendation that it needs to be followed up, always. What about this? <laughs> They couldn't get it up straight up, so they said, oh, I'll curl it around. And... What about this? That's the size of the asbestos paper. It actually looked like mastic. Oh, it is? When I saw it, I said, what is that? You did. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like this. Back that one out too. Yes, sir. That's after I lift the first thing. Yeah. It's not. There you go. That's one right there. You're going to have leakage around the sides. Well, it's called spillage, basically. Because this is a, a natural drafted water heater. Anyway, you know, you have to have somebody who's, who's, who are the licensed plumbers and HVACs in this crowd? Anybody? David Bledsoe was, I don't want to hear yeah, Okay. Is CO heavier than air? No. Um, there's been a discussion about where to place CO detectors. Right. The, the, some uh, manufacturers recommend placing them high, but the density of CO is such that it it it, it covers com complete the complete vertical aspect of a room. So you can plug it into a wall, you can take it halfway up the wall, or you can put it in the ceiling. My preference would be in the ceiling, but in areas where you have, let's say, a fireplace working. It needs to be in the wall because that's where our breathing zone is at that location. And I'll show you a couple of pictures here in a minute. Okay, so in essence we see something like this and you know when you see this trace amount of, of corrosion you have to ask yourself what's inside that pipe? What's deteriorated in that pipe? You know aside from the obvious you know you got a few things in this, and this is one that I did, I don't know how many years ago. Um, you know, roof leak, you got, that pipe is not, doesn't have the right clearance going through the roof. I wrote this up. Because that is the start of corrosion. You know, you have to say, corrosion noted. Um, you know, if this has yet to be examined by a licensed professional, you need to have it done. Both can do it. Yep. Right. 
right about it? No. Well, the byproduct of uh, natural gas is sulfur. And it's a caustic agent. So when you mix water with it, it comes, becomes sulfuric gas. Another thing that I've seen is these new tankless water heaters. They specifically want you to vent them right to the outside on the wall. And I have seen them vented into the chimney. You're not supposed to do that. No. I took this picture of a um, on a new system, a new, new construction um, on a, a furnace that, you know, you, you may wind up thinking, well, this is probably a deflection of the, the right burner on an igniter, but this is a spark igniter. It's not a, it's not a glow plug. So what happened was, and I found out later on from the builder that this jet, the uh, orifice in this right burner was, was uh, deformed. It was defective. So they weren't getting the right fuel to gas. I mean, this this is more of a yeah. It's the first one I'd ever seen. I thought, wow, that looks different. So how about something like this? Mm -hmm. oh, always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Again, to your point about increasing the size. Most of the corrosion that you're seeing on the outside of this pipe, you sort of wonder, wait a minute, what's inside of it? You know, how bad is it? Normally what I do is I'll go up to it and I'll squeeze it a little bit. If I can hear it crackle, it's gone. Plain and simple, you gotta replace it. But even still, you need to write it up. What's wrong with this picture? Poor correction. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're, is that gas log? Yeah, it's a, 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 a wood burning fireplace. It's a wood burning fireplace. Well, it's not drafting, right? It's got a burn right. test up there. And the other thing is, where is the CO detector? Yeah. 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 It wasn't. It's supposed to open it, but it's too heavy. So, again, getting back to sources, mm -hmm. if it were me and I had a source like this or a, a utility room down in a basement, how many of you have ever seen? A finished basement inside without high low vents. Yeah, seen enough of them. Um, there needs to be one down there in that location as well too. How about something like this? All the time. Mm -hmm. See a lot of old chimneys with no rain caps on. No. What do you think the mortar joints between the tile looks like <laughs> after about forty or fifty years? Holes in it. Oh, yeah. Okay. What about this? An old stove. Yeah. I've measured, I have a, uh, it's called a back rack. I have a uh, CO monitor mm -hmm. that measures, it's pretty accurate actually. It measures from one part to 999 parts per million CO. I've gone, when I've done uh, energy assessments on houses, I've, you know, part of the requirement of BPR, BPI, and I'll get into that here in a little bit, asked for is that they ask for us to measure the output of that oven when it's running. Take a guess on the parts per million on some of these old stoves that I run. I had one that was 999. Parts per million off the chart, and they and they and BPI says that the maximum allowable is 200 parts per million. Remember the chart at 200 parts per million. How much time do you have that you can withstand that amount of CO in any one given area? And especially with some of these stoves that have microwaves installed on top, and all that gas is actually coming back to the kitchen. I think there would be a vent above that stove. A hood? Yeah, there could be one there just because. Yeah, I, I just took this time. picture yeah, and then this was one of the energy assessments that I did. The old days they didn't have that. It was just there. I mean, I knew you had your ceiling. Now they have the hood above. Correct. There's no requirement. Right. Well, I can tell you that all the easy off oven cleaner you can put in this oven is not going to clean where it needs to be cleaned the most, and that's down below this, this burn. 
this, this plate, lower plate. Because those burners do get dirty over time. And when they do, there goes your gas air ratio. And the flames come out yellow. It's like underneath that water heater I showed you. So, you know, in a case like this, you know, when you're starting to look at ovens like this, you, you almost have to say, look, it's an old oven, you may want to consider replacing it. Don't even talk about CO. Just put it in your report and say, look, this is something that when these ovens get old like that, they can become inefficient. They can off gas a little bit more CO than what you need to. It's best to go ahead and look at a new oven. Again, like I said, it's, it's, this part of it is, and you can see a little bit, this is kind of common what I see, a little bit of, uh, of a jet problem there. When you start seeing something like this, you say, okay, well, you know, it probably needs to be cleaned. Somebody needs mm -hmm. to clean the orifices on all these, all these burner plates. Or it could be a pressure problem of some sort. It could be a mix valve issue that, that is causing that, that creating that. Because it being common to most all of the burners, you think, well, what's common to all of the burners? Is it because it hasn't been cleaned properly? Or is it because, it, you know, it just needs maintenance and adjustments. Again, BPI, when they came into being, um, and this was back in 08, the Georgia Power had adopted, they went from South Face and the Energy Star program to BPI, and BPI was the uh, force behind all these combustion safety checks on all this equipment. We could not promote having um, a client do energy upgrades on the house until we were sure that if they had gas appliance that they were operating safely. Uh, the procedure is pretty, well, even though it's short, unfortunately it's, it's a procedure that um, it does take a lot of time. It's a roll pain in the neck to do. I don't like doing them, uh, but it's only six pages long, and it has you taking pressure readings, ambient pressure readings, pressures inside the flue pipes, and that's just not water heaters, that's all the, the uh, combustion uh, systems you've got in furnaces or one of them. And then of course measuring the output on the stove. So when you get to that point, you, so, you start to have a concern, this is a, you have to excuse the photos, it, it turned out real well. This is a picture of one of the systems I do. This is a pressure read measurement while the system's running, and this is to check and see the spill rate. Now, BPI's uh, standard is that when, when this uh, water heater would start up, you're going to have a certain amount of spill out until this pipe got hot. And, and if, they, if I measured this pressure and it didn't come to a negative within one minute, it failed. Is that right? I mean, you went through this whole program, right? Okay. And then on the measurement side of it, any water heater that had was expelling more than 25 parts per million would also be a failure. And they've since changed that because now they're on the, 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 the latest development has it, the number slightly different. So, you know, this is another six page, nine page, uh, whatever. Uh, combustion uh, safety appliance, you know, it, it, that was really integral with that. And most people think that BPI is all blower door and duct leakage testing, but this was one of the things that you had to be checked out on, you had to show competency on in order to get your certification, so. There was an issue, uh, actually I took issue with one of the previous speakers, uh, it's been a while back, on orphan water heaters. Um, and part of it was the size of the combustion vent, which you, you kind of commented on briefly. But can anybody tell me what the real concern is with this? You know, again, it's CO, it's possible backdrafting. You're talking about venting into a chimney stack? That already had commingled an 80% furnace that they changed over to 95% and abandoned that connection between that Y connection, so you're going directly into the chimney. More than likely with a six inch vent. Well, 
Well, the potential is based upon its age as to, as to what it's bending into a, uh, a terracotta vent stack. Uh, you've got a variety of issues going on beyond the size of it, but the deterioration of mortar joints. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, then that creates a leakage issue back out into the, into the cavity of the chimney and maybe then into the living space as well, and likely into the living space. Uh, but that typically is, is, this one's kind of unusual looking because more commonly you probably would have a, a Y or a T type uh, thimble to connect what used to be for the furnace and the water heater being kind of connected together simply because of the discharge between both appliances running at the same time and then going into a, you know, uh, a six to an eight inch, by a nine inch terracotta pipe. Right. Uh, I mean, this, this is a solvable problem by sleeving it. Exactly. But, uh, Unfortunately, we know. can't always see these you're things. Right. You, you can't always see that and know that, sure. Yeah. So what, what you're faced with here is the spillage coming out. Because remember that one minute duration of time that, that PPI says is acceptable within one minute. You're going to extend the time because this pipe never gets hot. It has to, it gets to get hot to drag. Exactly. Temperature is the key. That too, and you got to consider what the manufacturer of the product recommends when they're venting. How they want you to vent that product. Which I have seen on a lot of my inspections, for some reason or other, the builders don't follow them. They, they vent it wherever they want. Well, the IRC has a, a chart, which we all are, are, uh, are one yeah. of two. Yeah. They have, there is a chart, or charts, I should say. There's multiple charts in there that go over the BTU input versus the size of the pipe. Right. right. If you're unsure and you can't get that information from the manufacturer, you need to revert back to that. Right. The manufacturer, you state, this is the way we want you to vent it. Period. Exactly. And I've seen a lot of places they don't do that. Yeah. They don't, they'll bend it into a chimney or wherever. Yeah. So, anyway, I still, you know, to me, when you see a setup like this, this is, you need to pay attention to how the, all of this is connected. So, um, Richard, yeah. how are you? Yeah. Oh, Richard. Can you be my timekeeper just in case? Because I'm going to rifle through this. Yeah. No, I was going to. I was going to look at about 10:30 uh, for a break. Okay. All right. I got enough time to go through this portion. All right. Let's move on to ventilation. Um, there are changes coming down January 1 of next year that are going to require builders to do some additional things. We're making houses tighter. The uh, air change per hour right now is set at seven as a max. Uh, it's going to five next year. Now, you're going to require that builders incorporate fresh air ventilation of some type. It doesn't matter. There's three different types that they're looking at. Um, and you can read this as you go through. It's either or. It's or. Uh, you know, you, you comply with the IRC, IMC, or ASHRAE 62.2. I haven't seen the 2016 book yet. I don't know if anybody, if you have pulled that document down, but the 2010 is what I've been currently working on. And it doesn't, the, the formulas don't change a whole lot, and they're very convoluted. I mean, you can go through this whole formula and spend hours on it to try to figure out how do you coordinate all of this fresh air ventilation, how you calculate it all out. But normally what I see, and you're going to see a lot of this, is that you're going to, you're going to see these fresh air vents coming in from outside, damper control. Or you're going to see an ERV. We don't use very many HRVs down here, but an ERV or, or the damper control product is what you're going to see. Very rarely are you going to see somebody uh, do a calculation with the 62.2 2016. That's probably not going to happen. And it's cost related more so than anything. Because it requires time for the HVAC contractor to come in and, 
and do his calculation and figure out what size pipe to put in and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so what they'll do on an ex as an expedient method is to just go ahead and fit a pipe out to the outside so that when the air handler is running, it's not only siphoning return air from the house, it's also diluting it with fresh air from the outside. Where's a place you don't want to put this vent termination? Maybe. Dryer, dryer, dryer. Dryer. Yeah, that's one. What about the dry, next to a driveway? I mean, siphoning in there. You mean like there's the uh, externally or like to a garage door right. opening or something of that nature? Anywhere where there's a vehicle going to be parked. Most of the time you find them high. You don't find them on, on a roof. <clears throat> and I, I'm not, you know, when I saw those and I've seen a few of those put in rooftop terminations and I'm not a big proponent in this area to do that. There's too many things that, at least in our climate, that you're going to bring in one of which is heat. So if you're bringing in a rooftop where there's, what, 130, 140 degrees of temperature rising up off those shingles, you're creating a condition for the HVAC system to work harder to try to resolve that temperature variance. I don't know that I've ever seen one on a roof. I've, I've, I've probably more commonly seen them off of a gable side or something like that mm -hmm. the HVAC and the shaded attic. side of the house the shaded side of the house yeah. exactly what if this was a southern facing portion of the wall and this was a northern facing portion where would you put it in this climate north but you got to be careful because we have a kitchen exhaust vent and we also have a bathroom vent here it's got to be somewhere far enough away where you're not going to backdraft some of that exhaust into the fresh air bed. Why not? Cooler, cooler uh, temperatures. Especially because we are in we are in an air conditioning society here in Georgia. Yeah, Seven to eight to nine months out of the year is air conditioning. The only concern that I have is North is you've got moisture and I've seen vents that are really, really green all the way down. Yep. Yeah. That's my Well, you just don't want it facing the sun. That's the big thing. You want it in a shaded area of, of the wall. Anybody think of another area where you wouldn't put a vent like this? An input vent? Okay. Is this, this is talking about combustion or is that right? No. Uh, talking about make up fresh air. This this is a siphoning of this is outside air coming into the system. When this air handler is running, the blower unit is taking from this duct and this duct and, and diluting it and distributing it out throughout the rest of the house. You're going to see more, way more of this than you will of that. I'm not a huge proponent of. Uh, ERBs. They're expensive, number one. I mean, if you had to go buy one off the shelf, you're looking at, what, $1,100, $1,200? And to have somebody put it in, you're looking at another grand. By the time you get something like that put together, you're looking at $2,500 to $3,000 after you get all the ducting done. This is an electronic type venting element in which you're cross feeding air from the Correct. outside to the inside. Concept is other. great. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. Uh, a, a brief case study I did on a house in East Cobb. The house was huge, completely foamed. Had an air change of less than four. The problem was, is with them, and we had two of these in this house. The problem was is that we could not keep the house from going to negative with those vents. Because you, you have to consider that you've got bathroom exhaust, you've got dryer exhaust, you've got just natural tendencies for the house to updraft or to stack them itself. And we, it, we wound up having to take them out and put an 8 inch vent and dump it into a dehumidifier from the outside and do it timed. Why, so. why, is the, why was the original intent for a 7 
air exchanges in an hour. I mean, that's every, that's less than 10 minutes. You're replacing all the air in the house in, in every 10 minutes or less. Well, here, here's the, here's the, um, the calculation. Yes, you're right, but we measure it when it, it, at, a, at a point where it's 50 pascal, which is equivalent to about a 20 mile an hour crosswind hitting any side of the house. That's a constant right. speed, okay? When you look at ACH natural or ACH nat, it takes and runs a calculation, 0.35 is it? On the, I think it's 0.35, which is, which is a, um, a calculation that governs what our regional weather characteristics are. Right. So in essence, the, the seven air changes an hour was adopted, I mean, from, from day one, and South Face had a lot to do with this. Uh, folks at South Face said, well, you know, we have to build houses tighter in order to make them energy efficient. Okay, I get that. But little press was given to this. Little or no press was given to this. So what we're faced with right now are houses that are tight that don't have any of this incorporated in. Houses that they're, you know, and I go into houses when I do blower doors on houses, I'm getting threes and fours. I mean, great, how, you know, how the houses are tight, but none of them have this in it. What's that going to do to the indoor air quality of a house like this? Your moisture is not going to be managed correctly. You're going to wind up creating yes. potential bulb problems. I mean, it, it's just, it's a fire waiting to happen on some of these houses that haven't adopted this, this principle in, in 2020. And I think we need to explain also though, that that's on new homes, that old homes built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, they're going to have so much to leave, it's just way above the seven. Right, unless you modify them, unless you upgrade them and say you strip all the fiberglass insulation out and completely foam and encapsulate the entire building. So when you're testing homes that are three and four, those are primarily built Phoned houses. Or built in the last you know, two or three years. Correct. Even at five and six, you're still needing a certain amount of fresh air ventilation. So, you know, the indoor air quality will suffer from this particular issue on some of the houses that were built here just recently. Uh, it's almost a given. So as we start to inspect these houses, the resales, if, if one of these vents isn't in, and you look at the certificate and you see, oh, this, this house had a four or a five air changes per hour, you need to note it. No fresh air ventilation. You know, you don't even need to send, you know, uh, ring the fire alarm over it, but just at least let your client know that this house does not have fresh air ventilation. You know, again, ASHRAE 62.2.2016. This is a little bit of the formulation. There's a lot more to it than that, but I pulled this off of uh, Energy Star's website. And this is the 2010, which we're currently on. And as you can see, they formulate it based on the number of bedrooms plus one. And then they go in and they say, oh, uh, you also have to plus and minus out the alternative compliance supplement and the infiltration credit, which is the blower door result. So HVAC contractors aren't going to do that. So a lot of the design that you go to in, in something like this is based on, yeah, I think it only needs a six inch vent, or I think it needs an eight inch vent. They don't know what's adequate. So here we are again, trying to guess things out, you know? The other problem comes in from the spray phone I inspected a home last week, spray foam on the underside of the rafters, completely sealed up, no venting, still had 80% efficient burn. Oh my God, I would send, her, send the bells off on that and one. So I wrote it up and then the realtors are going back and forth and the realtor for the, the listing agent is getting uh, reference from the HVAC contractor and he's saying, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. It's out of your hands at that point. point. Uh, you, you can't say anything more than that. Hey, it's on him. All you can do is point it out. That's it. I'm sorry? All you can do is point it out. 
That's all you can do. Because you take the monkey off your back and also the potential liability. I know it doesn't sit well with some of these agents when you're pointing stuff out like that because they think, oh, are you trying to wreck my deal? I hope there are not any agents in here. There's some deal killers, Yeah. Um, all right. Any questions? Would you, yeah. would you put any boilerplate language in your report to cover this? Do I put any what? I'm sorry. Um, kind of like standard caveats that uh, limit liability. Uh, oh, yes. Absolutely. Do you, do you have suggested words? Well, in, in situations like this, I try to revert back to the professionals, licensed professionals. Whether, whoever that may be, because if you need, if you're going to divert the liability off your own shoulders. You need to make sure that you say, you need to have this evaluated. You need to have this looked at. If this has yet to be looked at, you need to have somebody who is who is an expert at looking at this. To certify that this is safe to use or certify that this is adequate. Anything that kind of shifts away the responsibility in the event that some of our clients, and I tell you, some of them will turn Jekyll and Hyde on you pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, in six months, you get a call, well, wait a minute, you said that this, you didn't write this up in a report. And not writing something up in a report is saying something wrong. It's just almost the same. Mm -hmm. So you always recommend a professional career. If it looks, if it looks squirrely, if it looks like you're it has a potential risk factor. You're not the expert on it. No, you're, you're not. You have to stay away from right. being an expert. That's right. Yeah, the only thing you can do is, it doesn't look right. You better get an expert in there and have them look at it. Yep. Note it in your report. That way if they come back, do you know? Well, yeah, it's in the report. Right. All right. Uh, let me see what else we got here. Oh, 2016. Again, because uh, if, if you, if any of you are interested, uh, I went on to a website, Residential Energy Dynamics, and they have online calculations for this particular formula in the 2016, 2010, 2013, 2016. It's in there. You just go online, you type in all your, you know, your elements to the calculation that spits out a report for you tells you exactly how much CFM you need. So, you know, what I wouldn't put this in a report, but I mean, just this for your own information. Sorry, can you read that? Okay. All right, let's move on to filtration. Um, this is near and dear to me. Um, you know, so many times you go into houses and you see that the maintenance hasn't been kept up with. Systems are dirty. Connection issues. Corrosion. I don't understand when you're looking at a big ticket item like an HVAC system, why people don't take better care of it. It's like not changing oil in your car. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know, and it's out of sight and out of mind. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't know. That's why I say it's about money. Take, take that return air filler on there and look in those vents. The front of you take a picture of it and note it in your report. How many of you all inspect filters? Good. I like that race. All right, I do too. How many of you have ever seen All right. With a number of filter filter systems out there, what do you think the best, in your opinions, what do you think the best filter system is on the market today? Four inch plated. Best filter out there, not on the market, but out there. Depends on who you have. Air is probably one of the larger manufacturers of, of making. Right. Uh, higher, higher efficiency filters with a, with a higher amount of medium 
are material in there for air passing through. Correct. And that yeah, less less uh, uh, surface, surface resistance to yeah. air movement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a good product, by the way. But the best filter system is the human lung. You're killing me. It is a, a miraculous. <laughs> I, I would say God gave us this to protect us from the most hostile environments known to man, and that's our homes. It filters a lot more than air. Oh my God, it does. Mm -hmm. And without it, we wouldn't be able to survive. It's the most important organ in the human body. Um, when we start looking at the amount of air we breathe on a daily basis, and we spend 95 or 90 to 95 percent of our time is spent indoors, why not have good indoor air quality? Um, you know, we have a, a lot of issues and a lot of folks deal with this, especially folks with children who, uh, you know, when you get the ages of one to four, you know, these, these uh, toddlers' lungs are just starting to develop. And it's easy for them to con contract bronchial diseases, asthma, and so forth. And the same with the elderly. They can succumb to some of the worst illnesses, especially people who are autoimmune deficient, people who are being treated for cancer, uh, the, uh, people who are old and their systems just don't have the, uh, are, you know, their, their ability to fight infection is, is really diminished. Those are the people that are most susceptible. But in the area of particulates, you know, our, our lungs filter out a lot of the particles that are large enough where these cilia, which is basically in the deepest section of our lungs, these little hairs down here will trap the larger particles. And then at that point they'll get thrown, they'll get they'll get coughed up with the mucus and everything. So our bodies have the built-in ability to maintain that filtering system. The problem comes into be because the human lung is not perfect is that when you, ever, you breathe in a particle that's less than two and a half microns, it's, the, the term respirable is, is that your, your lungs cannot readily filter out these, these small components. And these components, you're dealing with asbestos, you're dealing with lead, you're dealing with animal dander, you're dealing with all this. So these stay in your lungs, get trapped, these small particles get trapped in your lungs a lot longer. And over time, if you don't get rid of these, these become a health risk. They become problematic. So what, what we're trying to do is, if we're, we're talking about filtration in, in HVAC systems, we want to be able to filter out the best air we're, our, we and our family are going to breathe through the course of time that we spend in these houses. So with all the filters that we have out there, and there's a lot on the market. I mean, there's, you know, April Air is one of them, and again, that's a good product. Which one do we choose? The cost most for our HVAC system. system. What's a good filter to choose? How many of you are familiar with the MERV system? That's a good, that's a good, actually, it's, for me, it's the only, uh, you know, it's the only issue for me on a filter because you'll see filters say we filter out 95 or 99 percent of all the pollen and all. Well, what is that? What size is it? Well, a MERV chart is basically a chart that was developed for ASHRAE, and um, it goes from MERV one to 20. MERV one being the worst case scenario, and, and, and 20 being ultra air. You know, if, if you read this, if can you all see these numbers the whole no. time? No. From three to ten microns, from one to three microns, and from 0.3 to one micron. You took look at a MERV one through four, and you're filtering out less than two in ten particles at that size, and it doesn't filter out anything in the smaller range. So what good is that filter? That's a proper price filter. Zero. Yeah. You know what we see in fil filters? Who, who has an idea on what the MERV rating on a construction filter is? 
Eight. Well, pigeon filters are six. I'm talking about a, a, a plated a paper filter. Yeah, pleated. A pleated, okay. Not, All right. not, your, not your average 50 cent filter that you right. buy. That's a, that's a, it's probably a zero. Yeah, pretty much. They filter out the rocks. Anyway, um, it isn't until you get the 9, 10, 11, and 12 where you start to see the graduation of, hey, the, these filters are going to start capturing things. They're in the range where these particles can become respirable. Remember that two and a half micron range and the lungs and what the lungs has the ability to filter out beyond that point. So let's just take a nine as an example. Less than 50% effective at filtering out a, a, a particle size range from one to three. Is that adequate? Is that adequate for you and your family? You got to answer that question at some point. Oh, by the way, this part of the disregard this part of the um, the chart. This means absolutely nothing anymore. I mean, this the chart started out with this arrestance and dust spot evaluation, but this is today's standards on filters. And it's the only standard that I know. Sandy, one of the things that also comes about is that our, the equipment themselves being able to withstand the resistance right. exactly. that you're right. beginning, right. you know. You, you can get nines and tens pretty pretty right. regularly at easy. Yeah, that's Home Depot stuff. That's, that's Home Depot stuff. But you start getting yeah. pushing towards HEPA filtration, these systems aren't capable. No, they're not. They're not. You're going to increase the static pressure where you'll reduce the, the life of the equipment. Right. Well, it's shut down. The gas furnace will shut off. I'm sorry? A gas furnace will shut off. Right because you'll wind up tripping that uh, high temperature switch. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Where do we find that chart? Um, you can go online and set MERV chart. MERV chart. Do a Google on, on MERV chart. And you'll pull it up. You can do an image. You can do an image search or whatever. But they're all, all the charts are going to be the same. This is the same data that's, that was used back in 99 when they developed this. Okay, got a question for you. Okay. You or a member of your family are allergic to dust mites. What MERV filter, based on these two charts, what MERV filter would you select to give you the best air quality? Now look at this chart now. The dust mites are right here. And it's from the dust mite size is slightly over one down to about less than a half maybe micron, size micron. What MERV rating filter is going to accomplish taking care of that, that part? To what percentage you want it? Well, that's, that's a good question. You have to look at, there are two things. One is for how effective you want it to be, and the other is, are you going to compromise the equipment by putting over doing something over, like you said, you know, with creating so much static pressure, you put much more strain on the blower unit. Well, a 16 gives you greater than 95%, and you get, you get to a 17 and, and further up the scale, and then, but then you're also compromising, compromising the, the efficiency and the life, and the, actually the equipment being able to run. Correct. So you have to, you have to, there's a juggling act with this. When I have a client ask me, a question, well, I, I want to put in a HEPA quality filter. Well, be careful. You need to talk to your HVAC contractor. If you're going to do that, you need to consult with him to find out if the equipment is capable of handling that. That type of your 80% carrier furnace is probably not going to work. No. Carrier, uh, carrier has their infinity system. I had one on my house. And they're, they're not cheap. They're $700 out of the box. Mm -hmm. But it incorporates a, a MERV 16 and an electrostatic plate which produces ozone. I got rid of it. I mean, the filter, the media part was fine, but the characteristic of what, or the, the component that I was dealing with when that electrostatic 
uh, portion of the filter was not in operation. It said, I would go out, do an inspection, come home, and I smelled this air that smelled like Clorox. And I'm thinking, it's cleaning in here. And I thought, well, this does, it's not right, you know, because my wife wouldn't be home, nobody was home, it was just she and I. And it suddenly dawned on me after I put this in, well, maybe let's turn this this air this electrostatic air cleaner off, and we'll just do the medium. It turned out that's what it was. That's the byproduct of ozone, and what it was trying to clean up. But at what level does the ozone become uh, a detriment? Because I mean, ozone is around all the time anyway. It is. It is, and that's another component that I hadn't gotten into. I haven't looked at the charts here lately, because it fluctuates sometimes. You'll get. OSHA says it's this amount one year, and then they say, well, no, it's this amount. It, 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 but it's pretty close, and I'm thinking, I hate to even guess at this point. It's less than 10 for sure, parts of the But you're really looking at probably down in the low range of, of less than one. The other, the other aspect that comes about as to whether we're dealing with uh, an active live dust mite viable uh, as opposed to one that's not viable. One right. That's and you're looking at you're looking at dust mite feces. Right. And you can't do anything about that unless you uh, create a clean room in your house. You know, environment environment that's HEPA or, or ultra air built. And some people require that because especially asthmatics. I mean, I was involved with a situation where we had to create a room in a house where a 12-year-old boy who had asthma, anytime he walked outdoors, he was, it was almost threatened to a flight. So we had to put a room, uh, set up a room with no carpet. Everything was plastics. Uh, all the cloth materials and everything were all hypoallergenic. I mean, it was... It was a pretty intense situation for this boy. Really felt sorry for him. Um, but we had to use an ultra air system to circulate air in and out of this room. So, but you, you get the point of where we are with this on the scale of what you can what you can choose from. You know, obviously most of the systems out there. I don't know of any. I don't know if you all do. I don't know of any. HVAC system that runs HEPA or ultra air. I mean, you're going to find a range anywhere from, say, 10 to about, and stretching it would be a 13. But your media plate has to be huge. On a five ton air handler, you almost have to open up the entire side of that unit if you're going to side mount that filter rack. So, all right. More than How many of you have pulled a filter out and saw that it was installed incorrectly? <laughs> All the time. Rarely. <laughs> Surprise, right? <clears throat> Backwards. How about something like this? Oh, yeah. Oversized filter. Looks like it's working. Yeah, I've seen those too. How about something like this? Uh, open up that door and you say, oh my god, there's no filtration. Well, Homer says, well, I just changed the filter. Really? I've only had to change the filter twice in the last two years. <laughs> and you start to think, oh my god, what's the rest of the system look like? Again, some of this, this filter's in backwards. How about something like this? You see a lot of this in condos. That's a older companies. That's a 16 or a 17 right there. Because it's our, at that point, it's developed to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, you see a lot of this, and you start thinking, you know, oh, I better kind of peek around that and, and take a look and see what the evaporator looks like. Because if it looks like that, and the filter is, is kind of crushed and damaged like that is, you know there's going to be buildup of that same amount of material on the evaporator. And God only knows what the blower unit looks like because you can't even get into that on a heat pump without dismantling. Something like this. I think, and, and I'm kind of glad to see that the, the HVAC industry has moved away from this type of internal blower unit filtration system. These things ought to be, uh, I mean, they ought to be just completely changed out. Those are old dinosaurs. 
you know, we, I don't know if, if when you see something like this and the way these filters are installed and how dirty they are, how many of you have ever looked at the blower unit? Yep. Need to. Because we're looking at level of maintenance. My expectation on a, on a blower unit that looks like this is that that's got to be five years, six years maybe. Down the road, you're going to see that sort of build up. Not a one year. I mean, if I saw this at the end of one year, I'd say, wait a minute, we've got something where you already identified a problem with the way the filters arranged in this unit. How about something like this? You know what this does to air movement? It's noisy. It's noisy and it makes it inefficient. When I was working for a defense contractor in Baltimore, when I was in uh, actually part time in college, we would um, we would look at jet engines. Not I wasn't a mechanic by then, but I mean, we were getting shown a bunch of stuff on that, on that military stuff, military hardware. They wash these turbine vents on these jet engines down regularly because if they don't, even just the ambient air that they suck in is going to laminate the veins on these turbines and it, it creates more resistance to airflow, air movement. You're looking at, on this particular blower unit, you're looking at a 50 plus percent reduction in air movement. What's that do to your indoor air quality? What's that do to your energy <coughs> consumption? And wear and tear on the equipment. How about when it looks like this? It's gone. Completely. No indoor air quality, high energy use. You know, this is an older system, but you know, nobody's kept up with this. And that's kind of sad in a way because, you know, even though the National Association of Home Builders says that the average life expectancy of HVAC equipment is 15 years, I've seen them, if they're maintained correctly, you'll get 20 plus years out of these systems. 25 maybe, if they're maintained. Maintenance is probably the best money that any homeowner will purchase on this equipment. That's money spent, if it's done correctly. Brand new system I looked at um, back in May. Brand new. Uh, system was installed in an attic. You look at the impingement filter in this thing, and of course, you know, again, getting back to your point about the filters are basically junk, what they put in. Do you think this filter needs to be changed? Absolutely. Yeah. It need to be turned around. It's not loaded in that. <laughs> Believe it or not, an impingement filter works best when it has more dust on it because there's more surface tension for additional particles to attach itself to. What did you call that filter? Impingement. Basically, you, as you can see a little bit of it, you can see through it. If I can see through it, it's not ready to be replaced. Uh, paper uh, filters, uh, uh, pleated filters are a different story. I mean, you have to be careful on that. Again, this is filter installed wrong. I don't know who put this filter in, but it wasn't the HVAC contractor. I would trust that the HVAC contractor knows where the arrow should point. No, not necessarily. <laughs> really? Turn it around. It'll, you know, the other side will start collecting. I could flip this whole picture around upside down and we can get it pointed the right way. The other part of this too is that this filter rack's not sealed. Mm -hmm. See the gap between the air handler chassis and, and the filter rack? Where's that ambient air coming from that's coming in from the attic? Loaded with fiberglass. Plus that hole that's up in this location mm -hmm. right here. A lot of times I don't see caps put on these. If you don't see a cap on that compartment or wires that are going through that don't that are not sealed, you need to point that out. Otherwise, that blower unit, and then of course, if you see a blower unit that looks like that, you almost have to anticipate the evaporator is going to look the same. So when you ask, whenever I um, write up a situation like this, um, and let's say that 
the customers, my client's not ready or the seller's not ready to replace the equipment, this type of maintenance on this is a little bit more involved than your standard routine maintenance. And it's going to cost more. In this particular blower unit, you're going to have to remove the blower. And you're going to have to remove the evaporator in order to take it out in the yard and pressure wash it, clean it, and then reinstall it. You're looking at a day's worth of labor for an HVAC contractor to get this done. Good point. Because you got to pump down the system, you got to cut the leads, you got I mean, it's not just cleaning it, it's like taking it apart and putting it all back together. Not quite an install, but it's, it's getting there. This is also one of the shortcomings with people who do duct cleaning as well. It's, you know, cleaning the inside of the duct is one thing, but when you have this particular that's now developed on the squirrel cage in this case, and then other areas, the evaporator coil, even to the point of the uh, the head element with the uh, heat exchanger is if they're not clean, you're really not doing much. No. So it, it's cleaning a system is, is exceedingly more involved. Exactly, I, I, I'm totally agree with that. But here's another issue that, that you all need to pay attention to too, is that how is that filtration system set up? The, the focus should be that every bit of air we breathe we breathe every bit of air that comes through this blower unit should be filtered. There shouldn't be any bypasses. That filter rack door should be air sealed. Not in such a way where it looks like this. Where there's gaps in between. Why isn't that sealed up? I mean, I called that out on this filter. Even the cover plate that goes on there isn't a sealed unit. No. It's it's this is absolute trash, the way this was set up. I'm sorry. I have no other words for it. I wouldn't say that in a report, mind you, but you need to do a better job. Are you saying there is no Yeah, but he's a little bit. There is a door. But the door is not weather sealed. There is no gasket material around the door like you would see normally on an April Air or Honeywell or, or even Train. They, they all have weather seals around those compartments. And when you install one of those, it's very specific. You seal the connection points all the way around on the blower unit and on the plume. So no ambient air enters that filter rack or leaves it. Um, I don't know if I want to get into this. This is actually, well, I'll, I'll do short, I'll short you on this, but this is the system that I currently have in my house. Um, getting back to the fresh air ventilation, I, I um, ran the calculations. I, I my, my whole house is encapsulated. It's foam. Attic foam. I got my air changes down to less than two. When I went and did the 2010's ASHRAE 62.2, I needed, based on the number of bedrooms plus one, I needed somewhere in the excess of 200 CFM of air flow. Now this aided then now the ducted dehumidifier of this April Air V100 has two input sides. It has an eight inch and a, a six inch. I had to take and pipe both of these to the outside in order to get my 200 CFM. That I needed. So what it does, it dumps it into the return airstream, filters it, and, and it's processed through the the uh, HVAC. So, but that's and it's great. I mean I. That's right. You know, I mean, my, uh, my wife loves it because she doesn't have to dust so regularly. But it's... Are those two, are those, Sandy, are those two ducks coming in on the top of that ultra air? Are those, am I seeing two ducks? Yes, that's an eight inch and a six inch. What they do it is, there's two input sides. There's one for an out, outside termination and one for an inside termination. But I elected to put both of them outside because I needed that additional 50 CFM or whatever it calculated out to be. And even then, I still wasn't adequate with less than two air changes an hour when I ran that calculation. Is that air tempered in any way before it comes in? No. No, but the ducts and everything are all isolated. And what it amounts to is this is not a constant airflow. Your, your, uh, your calculations can be either nonstop or continuous or intermittent. 
what I have the humidistat set up as, and by the way, the way I wired this is that the April layer is wired to the, uh, the April air blower, that is, is wired to the blower unit. So whatever that April air goes on, the blower unit goes on to create that, that movement, that air movement through a negative blower. Right. And what I have mine set up as, because it's just my wife and I in the house, is um, I have it set for uh, once an hour every 10 minutes. And it shuts itself off. But the other part of that component is that that remote humidistat also monitors the relative humidity in the basement. So if, when that get, and I have my set point at 50, so whenever the relative humidity goes up and, and, and trips that 50 point, it turns on the dehumidifier in there, and it makes water. So, all right. I know this is what you all wanted to talk about. Question. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, um, UV is a, I don't commonly see those except for on retrofits. Um, there is an advantage point to using UV in conjunction with a, a filter medium. Uh, you wouldn't use UV as a sole uh, feature to, to filtration. You still need to clear out the particulate loads. UV is more, respond, what responds to UV is more in the bacteria range and, and the uh, virus range. But you have to remember also too the velocity of, and where you place the, the UV light is really important. What you want to be able to do is maximize the illumination points of the UV at, at, to give you the furthest out incoming and output beyond the, the attachment exposure. Because the velocity of air that's coming past that light is pretty, pretty intense. I mean, you're looking at, I don't know, a couple of hundred feet per second. Maybe. Whereas if a, if a known bacterial part of travels through that, if it doesn't get hit with the UV fast in enough time, it's almost worthless. The other part of that too is that UV um, a UV light setup is you do not want to set it up in any area where there's plastics because the UV will degrade. Plastics, you'll have collateral damage with it over time, and they are expensive. The bulbs are hundreds of dollars to replace, and they last. I don't know, maybe somebody else can correct me on this, but uh, I've seen them last maybe a couple years, and they're gone every year. But if they're on continuously, so when you hook them up, you've got to you got to think, okay, do I want this? Why do I need it on continuously? It should be on when the system is running. So your wear and tear is less, so you, you'll have longer life out of the ball. So, any other questions? We ready to take a break? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. You're there. Thank you. Oh, I'm here. All right. Before we get into this next topic, I want to revisit something briefly that we were discussing about cleaning ducts. Um, you may and. I'm sure you, most of you have heard a client say, hey, is it better for me to get the ducts clean? Well, yes and no. Flexible duct work is almost next to impossible to get to 100%. Mm -hmm. You're almost better off replacing it. And it gets into this. You could probably get a, a system clean for about, what, 350, 400 maybe? Somewhere in that price range on an average two, two and a half hundred drive system. But the, the reason for cleaning ducts is, is the obvious, is that you want to improve the air quality, but if you don't take care of the filtration system first, those ducts are going to wind up in the same condition that you started with. If you've got a filter that's not installed correctly, a filter rack that doesn't seal, of, you know, a host of different things that you saw here, and I'm sure you've seen quite a few more, you're just 
throwing your money away. So keep in mind also too that if you're going to clean ducts, what you're cleaning are particulate sizes that are 10 to 50 microns in size. These are particles that do not stay aloft very long. They drop because of the sheer weight. So if you start doing an internal scrub on a, on a supply duct or a return duct, you're basically creating more dust. And then if, if your, your duct cleaning company has a good uh, suction machine, a good vacuum, they'll be able to take it all out. But a lot of times you're moving dust from one place to another inside those systems. And what your goal is, is to get your particulate size that's down between one and three microns under control. And these are particles that stay in the air longer. Okay? So if, if you do have a, a, a question brought to your attention about cleaning ducts in the house, kind of utilize what you've already seen in the way of what the condition of the system is. And, you know, you have a filtering problem, you have this, and just kind of make that suggestion to take care of something else first before you clean the ducts. If the duct cleaning is that important to you, that should be your last uh, uh, point of concern. So. All right, mold. That's a four-letter word. How many mold uh, sampling guys do we have in here? I do quite a few. Okay. I was just talking to somebody earlier and said, and I told them that some of my philosophies behind doing molders are going to be slightly different. Um, you know, I I go back to my days in, in the medical field, the medical industry and start looking at quality control and, you know, is this result right? Do we have 95% confidence in what we're trying to produce? And that should be our goal as well, too. But in the case of mold, there is not a common study that's ever been delivered to, to the uh, EPA that one person is more susceptible to certain types of mold than anybody else, than somebody else. So, we have all kinds of things and uh, phrases that you hear in the market, black mold, toxic mold, stacky botrys, this is terrible, that, that sort of thing. But in my uh, uh, initial day of getting trained on doing mold inspections in, back in 2003, I went through a 20-hour class that, and I read the certificate last night, it says, I have, or you have successfully completed the training in mold inspection and report uh, interpretation. Now, if any of you have gone through these types of classes, you think, okay, well, that that's, seems adequate enough. Is there a difference between taking a mold sample, send it off to the lab, and a mold inspection. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a big yep. difference. Yes. Definitely. It's apples and oranges. And I'm going to tell you why here in a second. You know, we're going to market ourselves as a mold inspector. We better be prepared to answer questions from our clients as to what type of mold it is, what are you inspecting, what's the cause, why is this the way it is. We have to become diagnosticians when we do this. Otherwise, we're going to get caught in a crack between our clients and possibly the, the agents that referred our, our clients to us. And our attorney. And our reputations are going to falter from it, too. So with that being said, uh, and I, I went out after, after I completed this class in 03, I was doing mold inspections. I was doing quite a few. And it wasn't until I had a complaint from one of my clients that said, you know, I put the report down on the table and I said, here's your report. And they look at this eight or nine page report and they say, well, what does all this mean? Well, it means you have mold. Well, what do you do to fix it? Well, how do I fix it? What, where is it? What's the cause? What is it? Where is it coming from? I didn't have the answers to that. You talk about feeling this little. That class only taught me how to be dangerous. That's all it was. 
when I look at all the training seminars I've ever attended in the electronics field, and some of these seminars were four, five, six weeks long on some of the most sophisticated equipment that you, you could ever work on, I only felt 50, 50 to 55% up on the learning curve. This, I was less than 10%. All I knew how to do was be a technician. I'm going to take your sample, I'm going to bag it, and send it off to the lab. When I get the report, I'm going to look at it, yep, you're elevated. And that was the only thing that I was to look at. I let the lab do it. The lab's responsible for determining whether or not. In part, that is true. Your laboratory, if they're ARHI, I think it's, they're, they're certified through an outside body to, in their quality control apparatus of their lab, they're, they're required to go through these, uh, not training, but they send these samples off to them. They say, well, they, they, they're unknowns to the, to the lab techs, and they say, what is this? And they better come back with the right answer. Because if they don't, they lose their accreditation. So they have to do this. In, in my wife's field, all the clinical laboratories are required to go through what's called CAP surveys once a year. And if they lose that accreditation, they could get the lab shut down in these institutions. And that's not good for medicine. So, so after I ran into a situation with one of my clients who got mad at me, and they said, well, what good is this? I just paid you $350 to do a couple of mold samples and you're not telling me anything. Well, during that argument I said, look, I'll, I'm gonna give you your money back. Because this client was one of my agents, was referred to by one of my agents. And I wasn't going to give my, clump, my agent any heartburn over this thing, so I said, look, I'm gonna give you your money back. It's, we'll just call it a wash. You, know, you got your result, here it is. You need to contact somebody else to try to diagnose what's going on here. So from that point, I went ahead and uh, went online and looked at an organization called the Indoor Air Quality Association. And I, I got to talking to some people there, and they turned me over to a guy out of Pittsburgh. His name is Joe Hughes. Um, he is a, he owns and runs a mold remediation company. He's an educator. He does seminars all around the country. 40-hour seminars, and he also has his own radio talk show once every an hour every Saturday. He has a pretty good show. He brings on guests, and he's you know somewhat entertaining. It's a bit you know magoo a little bit like it, but but I mean he does get his points across. So I went ahead and got my certified. I, I went and got his, went to his class, and it's a certified mold remediation class. 40-hour class. I went up to Whitbridge, New Jersey, and went to that class, and I learned a lot. His instructors, one of which is a uh, is a professor at uh, Penn State. Um, he's got a PhD in industrial hygiene. One of the brightest guys in this business that I know, and he's been, he's been my mentor whenever I come into a problem. Have and I haven't contacted him here lately, but. I've always kind of leaned on him to give me some advice on how do you how do you proceed with something like this, or what do you think the cause is? But it's not a clear-cut business to be in if, if you're just going to do samples. If you're going to be a sample person, somebody that all they do is to take the sample and do it, that's fine. But if you're going to go in and diagnose what the cause, root cause is, and how to correct it. You need to get some more education. That's all I have to say about it. Now, now, six months after I completed this course, I went ahead and, because um, it, 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 there are some factions behind this that really weren't complete in my mind, and that was the diagnosis part of it. Yeah, I understand, and I was in a classroom full of nothing but mold reading. I was the only mold inspector that was in the class. So all the contractors are in there. They were in different types of businesses. They carpet cleaners. Uh, uh, in New Jersey, I mean, of course, on the coast, they had these guys, they had a company guy representing a company there would clean boats out that would have mold in them. 
And there are different processes that they employ. There's so many of them out there. Uh, there's a couple of them that, that I was uh, made privy to when I, I went through that class that I understood to be, and as I read through these processes, they're pretty cut and dry. And it, it, it's you know basically what should be done. Everything from the type of applications on chemicals to the personal protection gear that one must wear while they're doing it. I mean, it's pretty descriptive. If anybody's interested in one of the one of these, there's a, a, a site that you can go on. It's called the New York City Mold Remediation Guidelines. It's a PDF you can download. It's about 30 some odd page document. It's what most of these mold remediators used in this class. Very simple process. Well, anyway, six months after I got out of class. I went uh, and sought out another company down in Fort Lauderdale, Enviro Team, and they did, uh, they were training uh, people on how to become certified indoor environmentalists. And I went through their 40-hour class, and I learned a lot in that class too. And the, and the, and the class was ba basically dealt with causational things, like moisture taught us how to search for it taught us how to, uh, you know, what, your, what the root cause is, how to remediate it, uh, how to remediate the water. Because again, water, it, to, water is the mold is sauce to a goose. I mean, you eliminate the water issue, then you can control the mold. You can't completely eradicate it, but at least you can control it to a point where you can arrest its growth. So they taught us about uh, the psychrometric chart where to look for dew point. I mean, there was a host of different things. It was a very enlightening course. So, has any, has any of you, have any of you ever heard of the American Council for Accredited Certification? Good. A very good referral source. There are three of us in here that I know of that took uh, classes through ACAC for uh, what was at that time classified as CRMI certification yep. or mold evaluation and assessment? They have all the alphabet soup acronym yep. certifications. It, it is an alphabet soup. That's right. <clears throat> if your clients want to find somebody who is adept at mold remediation or whatever, have them go onto that website and plug in your zip code, and they'll find a list of people. There's dozens of them. These certified individuals in Georgia. It's a good source. Well, anyway, I stayed on their website for a couple of years, but I tell you, it got too expensive. Each one of these certifications cost me $350 a year to keep. I was on for two years, and I said, I had to stay with what brought me here, and that was home inspections. And it's like, you know, I'm, you know I, I can't continue to dump money into two certifications that, that are not yielding me enough revenue as a business owner, enough revenue to, to keep things going like that. So. So I kind of moved away from it. Anyway, can anybody tell me which mold is toxic? They're all toxic. <laughs> they all can be. Right. Every one of these has the propensity of, of creating mycotoxins. But that doesn't necessarily mean if you see a site that has stocky and sacky on it or black mold or whatever, that it is toxic. You have to be careful about this when you report it. To me, it's not mold. How I see something like that, and this is important in your report writing, is that when you see something like that is suspicious of mold, your language in the report should not be, it's mold. It should be suspected mold. It's not mold until the lab comes back with a report to tell you that it is. The lab definition of a fungal growth. Correct, because the prof you are not the professional in identifying this down at a microscopic level. You need a, a med tech, which my wife is. She can do this type of work. But she has now since moved off the bench. But this is the type of work that's done at CDC. Hospitals do this type of work. Clinical labs, research facilities, they do this type of work, including places like ProLab, MSL. What are the others that are out there that do it? Spectrum. But, so, or even Yep. But 
I don't know that any of these three are toxic. However, on prolab side of things, and then each laboratory is run by their own pathologists, if they see if their med tech sees one stacky spore, it's elevated. It's an elevated condition. Because stacky has more of a propensity. As a matter of fact, there's from what I uh, talked to some of the med techs down in uh, that pro lab, that they're documenting, they've documented back when I talked to them, 22 species of stacky that have produced mycotoxins. And it's not an easy test, it's not an easy test, it's not an over the night test. You have to plate the material, you have to make it grow, and you have to look at, the, you have to do a gas chronometer test on it in order to find out are these gases, the MVOCs that it's producing, are producing toxic gas materials. So again, be careful with what you say and what you report. See something like that. Mm -hmm. It's suspected mold. It's suspected mold. When we when when we were doing that, uh, Charles, Mike, uh, Clark, you were doing it too, weren't you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Back over here. Clark was doing it also. Uh, fundamentally, we were just told to classify it as a as a suspicious uh, particulate. Yep. Uh, avoid the use of mold in its in term altogether, because even the suspicion, uh, giving it a suspicious element. To a client could obviously plant it where that's that that's what they're observing or that's what we're declaring it to be in a certain sense even though you're classifying it as a suspicious nature we avoided the term using it called mold we term fungal growth evidence of potential microbial growth. growth microbial growth things of that nature. I use the technical terms and let honestly you're not lying to them you're letting somebody else who's a professional give them the bad news right that's in essence what you're doing, and I'm all for that. Take the heat off your shoulders, absolutely. Um, the suspicion part of it for me is to raise the level of consciousness, but also give yourself an out if it turns out this is not old that you looked at. And you may want to get it tested. You may want to get somebody who's CIE, GIH, uh, or whatever you want to call it, somebody who's mold, uh, mold testing um, certified to come in and wind up running a swab or a tape lift off of this location and see. But honestly, if it looks like a goose, it smells like it, I am more reluctant now as a mold testing person to take somebody's money before the fact. Just clean it up. Spend your money on cleaning it up and then come back if you feel very uh, insecure about whether or not it has been cleaned up effectively you test out or what you call post-testing, post-clearance testing. And if you're that concerned, because you got to remember, if you provide a report to a client and says there is mold, you've got to disclose that. That has to be disclosed. I mean, the state of Georgia has very strict rules on disclosure on, on property transfers. So you have a you have this report on the table, and you're selling your house. Say, well, you have mold. Well, the buyer is going to come back and say, well, what did you do about it? Well, we had somebody come in and clean it. Okay, we had somebody come in and clean it. Did you test beyond that point? Did you do a post-testing to see if the work that was done was adequate? So you've got to test in and test out. I guess for me, in my mind, I'm trying to be a good steward of my client's money, and I want there to be continuing efforts on their part to refer me to other people. And it's more of a, not that I'm, I mean, if somebody twists my arm, I'll do it. But if I get a call, and I get calls from now and then for people that want mold testing done, well, my question is, what's your reason? What do you have? What is going on? Uh, is there a health component 
attached to this request. Uh, is anybody in your family, you or your family, getting sick? Is this a legal request? Is this, is this something that's gonna wind, that I'm going to wind up in court testifying to? Which I, I try to get out of those, and I've testified in a handful of cases with this type of issue. And even though a lot of it was kind of fun, but you never know when you get into court what's going to happen with things, situations like that. You, you commented earlier about one of the <coughs> one of the functions of this process would be, and the, you know, finding it, finding evidence, sometimes is the is the first thing that draws people there. Other times there are things that have to do with odor where things are not visible present right. there. But in the combination of both, cleaning it is 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 a is like a band-aid. You want to know why it's there. And right. What you want to ID, to ID the water source. Right. And the water source could be dew point issues. Whenever I'm in a house and I, I I'm looking around, if I see a mirror or a or a painting on an outside exterior wall that's flush up against the wall, I remove it and look behind it because that's where your dew points are going to occur. The one thing you tell clients is that the only thing out of the three elements that are required for fungal growth to develop, the only thing that you can manage within certain degrees is moisture. The others you can't do anything about because they're natural. They're Correct. Nature. They're part of nature. It's impossible to kill mold. Right. Plain and simple. It's I don't care what type of <clears throat> oxygen or bleach or, and by the way, bleach is not bleach a good disinfectant. Bleach is not a good Right. Uh, <laughs> You know, they have all these things on the market. You'll see uh, all kind of kills 99.9% .9 of mold growth and all that. That's BS. Yeah. It was here before, so it'll be here after. That's right. I mean, there, there'll be a, like this planet growth. could be nuked and there'll still be mold on it. So, anyway, you know, you see a lot of this stuff, especially in crawl spaces and basements and typically where there's high levels of moisture. But also keep in mind that if your relative humidity in a house is sustained greater than 60% for more than 48 hours, you will have a mold problem. That's your key point right there. Um, this is why HVAC is, is even though it's complex, the, the, one of the most important things, because we are in an air conditioning society, is that you can't just cool, you have to take the moisture out of the air at the same time. And the longer it runs, the more moisture you pull out of the air. That system has to create water. Is that mold? More than That's suspicious more. fungal growth. More than likely. More than likely. But in your report, your report should say, this is suspicious. Suspicious. Suspicious mold. You need to have it evaluated. Take the monkey off your back. Because otherwise this thing is going to, you know, it's we're gonna paint you into a corner. This is obviously extreme and a good yeah. point. Right. But there are there are smaller, significantly smaller areas, and those that really are not so obvious that can be seen. Uh, and if you just ignore them, you're you're not doing yourself a favor. Right. You need to at least make a reference to the fact of a condition that's suspicious in nature. When it comes to like that. What I have found over the years in doing uh, these mold remediation assessments. Visible ones is um, the typical condition I see is groundwater infiltration, storm water, plumbing leaks, and condensation. Those are the four elements and sources. If you have any of those four, it's a problem. Because groundwater especially, you know, when you start looking at pitch grade and, and things that have to do with, with storm water runoff, you know, even though the the grading is not right, and you see a downspout that's disconnected or not dumping water at least 10 feet away from the house, you're wondering, where the heck is that water going to? Well, I don't see a problem here in the basement. It is a little bit humid, but you gotta start with the basics. You gotta get them to extend those downspouts first. You go to the source. 
Because one way or another, chances are on older houses, especially block-built houses, that water is coming through that block. One way or another, it's going to get inside that basement. And then you're faced with, okay, well, I'm going to run a dehumidifier down here, and I'll control it that way. Let's just that's the first line of defense is to control that demon, that humidity level down to less than 60%. Um, your, your function should be, again, if it's, it's, it's kind of complex, but you start with the easy things first and you start working your way up into the things that are not common, like dew points. It's, that's very difficult to assess. I mean, it takes time to go through a house and see how everything is laid out, how all your flooding fixtures look. You, you, know, you look underneath the sinks, you look around the toilets, you, you look up in the ceilings, it's, you know, there's a drop ceiling, and these drop ceiling tiles go down as far as I'm concerned if I'm looking for a molded source, if I'm looking for a water intrusion source. I don't care if it's, if I, if I see one stain, that's a spot I'm gonna look, but if I don't see any stains, I'll look and find myself a vantage point of where a lot of this stuff is, you know, could be, manage or, or actually originate, you know, piping routes and all oh, the other part of this too is, is that whenever you see duct systems that are not wrapped in attics and crawl spaces, how many of you ever seen water stains around supply ducts? <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's automatic. You need to have an HVAC contractor come in there and wrap that, insulate it and wrap it. Otherwise, it's just going to get worse. You got two different environments there. You got ice cold air going through that ductwork, <coughs> hot to an environment out there. What do you got to get? That's right. You're going to get water. Back it up one. I want to see something. I see that when it's over home. And I believe a lot of that is caused by the air, moist air coming through those outside vents. Getting underneath that crawl space. What are you shooting at? You see what I'm saying? Well, the ICC says you have to have nasty amendment. Nope, not anymore, not after 2006. Mm -hmm. 2006, okay. the IRC changed and said you can do either or. Right? Yep. Yep. Because Code that, that is the major cause of what you're seeing with that major cause. The statistics on crawl spaces are. We have 35 million crawl spaces in this country, and most of them are here in the South. And practically every one that I've seen, with the ones that have been recently, with the exception of ones that have been recently built or remediated, are defective in one way or another. They don't put the plastic down either. Well, there for a while they said you just need to lay it out. No, no, Layer this green out. And Everything's cool. No, go You've got off-gassing from the soil. Now, the other thing that, that takes into consideration, too, on condensation in a crawl space, you have to remember that in the summertime, we're in a hot, humid climate. <coughs> Our temperature averages around 85 degrees with 75 to 80% humidity. When you take and drop that temperature, for every degree of temperature drop, you're raising the humidity level by 2.2%. So when you get from 85 degrees to 65 degrees, which is your gradient, gradient uh, geotech temperature, that's 20 degrees. You multiply that out, you're above 100%. Everything on the inside of that crawl space is raining down. Yeah. So what do you Ducks, piping, everything. What do you put in your report when you see something like that? So you need to get it remediated. Yeah. Get somebody who's experienced at remediating crawl spaces. But you're going to you're going to find builders who build uh, new crawl spaces now. They're they're really looking at the issues of the past and what they need to do to prevent them from having to get callbacks and warranty claims against their product. And they're building them, you know, encapsulated. But there is a there is an issue, and then what somebody briefly talked about encapsulating an 80% furnace in an egg, I think it was you, yeah. you'd gone through. Well, I've seen spray foam. spray foam, right. Well, you can spray foam walls in a crawl space right. and encapsulate. And I think that's the best of both worlds. 
for a crawl space because then you're bringing the temperature in close proximity to what the interior temperature of the house is rather than succumbing to the outside temperature in its extremes. So, but there is a give and take on this too because once you seal it off, you still have to deal with the latent moisture issues in a crawl space. You still have to have the humidification as a backup. How bad is what? Will it seep through the... Yeah, everything drafts upward. How many holes are in the floor that aren't sealed, especially in older houses? You look up where the, the tub drain comes through and you see a hole cut this big. And you see the bottom end of the tub. Same with toilets, same with HVAC ducts. And ducts are the worst. Because that's where all the... If you ever go in, have you ever gone into a crawl space when the boots aren't wrapped and sealed? And you, right around the area where the subfloor is located, it's all stained. That's because of the moisture that's in that crawl space. You're going to have moisture in a crawl space. Even with that plastic, I see moisture under the plastic. Right. The plastic. You can just see it. It just hangs right there. Right. You're, 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 what you're doing is you're creating a moisture plane. Right. A barrier, but you really need to do something with that moisture <laughs> underneath of it, too. Otherwise, the soil is just going to be stick damp all the time. There you go. You need to make sure your outside grading is right, your stormwater management, your groundwater management is, is right. Because otherwise, you're going to keep dumping water in that crawl space underneath the barrier. Where I do my inspection, I see a lot of homes that people don't use during the downtown. But the water runoff from underground. I see that. I think that's a major problem right there. Mm -hmm. I'll call it out if there's not gutters on the house. Always. But you also have to be careful when you put that in a report that, you know, on a 50 year old house, let's say, was that a requirement back then? I don't even think it's a requirement now, is it? No. It's not a requirement to have it, but you have to manage water runoff. You make a suggestion. Here's a suggestion you may want to put gutters on the house. See, that's what I do. I make a suggestion. Right, but try to keep it away from your bullet point efficiency page that you give to the client to give, because otherwise they're going to beat the seller over the head with it. Well, another thing too is if you don't have gutters and downspouts, you're going to see the erosion on the ground. Right, and you point that out to them. That goes into a port as well. Right. Okay. Right along. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Crawl spaces. This was a house I looked back at in March. I had a call. Yes, sir. You were talking about managing the moisture in the crawl space. So what, you know, how does that look? You know, what's your suggestions on uh, managing that? Um, <clears throat> number one, you need to isolate ground soil off gassing. And that's to put a, a vapor barrier that's sealed all the way around the foundation, around the piers. You want no air flow from the underside of that plastic to come up into the crawl space. Number two is to seal off all your vents. And then the third thing is to put a weatherized door, access door on. Insulated, weather sealed. So close all the vents to the... That's, that's the... There's a good website to go on at uh, crawlspace.org. It's uh, uh, Advanced Energy is the name of the company, but they wrote the book on crawlspace encapsulation. Crawlspace.org. Crawlspace.org. I'm sorry. You still have to keep a dehumidifier in that crawlspace. <clears throat> You know, let's imagine that you've got an HVAC system down there. Mm -hmm. It better not be 80%. It better be either a heat pump or high efficiency closed combustion. If you're going to use a, a gas fired appliance down there, it needs to be closed combustion. Whereas you're pulling direct air from the outside for utilized fuel utilization into the uh, burner compartment and then drafting it outside. Direct venting. Those guys have, uh, I mean, I, I send, some of the times when I'm doing inspections, I'll tell my buyers, 
you know, you've got a crawl space, you've got some issues in there, and I'll, I'll, there's an eight page document, and it's a good kind of reader's digest version of crawl space remediation and what to look for, things to make your crawl space better. Um, and I'll, I'll include that as a document in, in my report delivery. Um, and I'll let them read it and i say, look, if you want to do, go down this road and start looking at doing some of these procedures, I've, I've got names of guys that know how to do this in this area and do it well. So, all right, <clears throat> getting to this case study. One of my high-end agents who sends one to two inspections a month to me um, knows the, the tenants people who are renting this house. This is in East Cobb, Maria. Um, your typical 1,700 square foot ranch, 3-2 on a crawl space. When the folks moved in six months prior to this, it was a couple who had two small children. No problems at all with health issues. They have an infant and a four-year-old. Ever since they moved in there, the mother and the two children were getting sick. And my agent said, I need you to come over and take a look at this because we're trying to get them out of this rental and I'm trying to sell them a house. So this is where the linkage comes in to be. Um, I, I went by the house along with the agent and we sat down and talked. Well, we wanted you to do, we want you to do a mold test. We want you, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. You know, again, getting back to the reasons why. What, you know, I know you're getting sick, but there are other elements in this house that could cause, could be creating your illnesses. So, you know, doing a mold test is one thing, and, and you're not, you know, again, we may eliminate it, but there's a chance, a bigger chance, that we're going to find something else that's causing these problems. So after some discussion and on the table, I mean, they you know, twisted your arm and it was like, look, we'll pay for it. I said, okay, all right, no problem. So I went ahead and did the, the analysis. And of course, ProLab sends out a nine page report. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fluff in these reports. I mean, they could probably reduce this down to one to two pages because the rest of it is not pertinent. To me, as you go to a doctor, and, you, and the doctor says, I need, I need to send you off to the lab to have a blood test run. Do you want to know how they do it? Do you want to know what conditions they're under and what type of equipment? And I, that's, that's why I hired the doctor to tell me. You know, I, I want a diagnosis from somebody that knows what the hell they're doing. So a lot of this stuff is like when I plop this down on a table, one of the things that just jumped out at me, and I started looking at this because I saw this report before I delivered it, was that the lab came back and said that it's not elevated. <clears throat> How do you explain that? On whose criteria? The labs. Yeah, but who's the, that's just purely their opinion. Because Correct, there is but, no standardized. but they have a standard of operation which is dictated by the pathologist. Somebody who has a PhD. So it's within their scope. Of what within their about. scope. Each laboratory is different because they, they count on number of particles counted versus, you know, again, this was just strictly a, a um, what it ran was basically an aerosols on both the reference point and, and the, and the uh, interior. But so then ASP is the only thing that they're really showing up. That's a good. That's a good lookout, because it, you, as a, a mold inspector, need to be looking out for this type of stuff. You have to be the backstop to the lab. The lab is saying, "Yeah, it's not elevated," but I've got a known component in here that's not evident in the outside. How do you explain that? What do you, when you take a, an air sample, what, are you taking it as a bulk air, or are you taking bulk. it off of a non viable Okay. Yeah. And this is what we all do. This is the type of testing that we, we, we actually ask laboratories to do for us. 
What else do you see in here? No pin asked on the outside. That's that's really kind of unusual. Right. But the question is that there's no other particular than any of, of any of the others. I know. That's, that's what was so that's curious right. of me. This lady kept her house, and you, when you walked in the house, you didn't walk in with shoes. She claims everything. And this is out of defense because of the fact that she and her kids were getting sick. And she thought, my house is too dirty. So she went crazy in this place. You see where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, somebody looking at this without having interviewed a homeowner is going to look at this and think, well, wait a minute, the lab did something wrong here. And in actuality, they did it right. So we had a long discussion about this. So can you explain that to me, at least? Why we have elevated, why we have, oh, not elevated, but we have, we have moisture. Penis, penicillins in there? Yes. Penicillin yes. aspergillus. Okay, the questions that I asked when I sat down with a client like this, <clears throat> are you or any of your family members allergic to penicillin? Because if you are, yep. this could be your cause. So no. That's, that's a very low number still. It's still, but that's it's a, a trace element. Number. And you start to have to ask questions about, you know, where is all of this coming from? I mean, and a lot of this is based on process of elimination, okay? But the fact that we didn't find any other elements in the interior other than uh, aspergillus and penicillium was that this lady kept her house spotless in appearance. And I said, well, we've got something else going on. Well, they paid me $350 for this test. And I felt bad. I said, look, I'll do one thing for you, but you're going to have to clear out this because on the right side of this house, go back. You can't see it from this, but the, but the entry point to the crawl space was right here, and it was covered in kudzu. You couldn't even see the door. I asked them, I said, where's your crawl space entry? Oh, it's on the it's on the uh, left side of the house, or right side of the house. I said, well, if you can clear out all that stuff out of there and make way, I'll come back in a couple of days and I'll get inside there and look at it for you for a fee. So as crawl spaces may, you know, are, let me go back. Did you run the, uh, the blower on the furnace when you did it? No, and you'll find out, you'll, you'll soon understand why. She was also complaining that she was getting what looked like mold coming out of the supply ducts. She would clean it off. But she wasn't removing the register vents to clean up what is inside this thing. And that whole system is contaminated. This house is as close to what I would classify as a sick building syndrome house as I've ever seen. I've seen some nasty ones, and this one probably would rate in the top five. Show us the crawl space. I'm sorry? Yeah. All right. Here's right there, that says it right there. It's been a little bit. that first picture you showed, plants all the way around the house. Yep. You don't want that. At least three foot from the house, you can have nothing. Except wash around. Well, I was half expecting to see cuts that inside the crawl space. <laughs> you know, grown up in there. Yeah, I was thinking about getting my machete out and start hacking away and stuff to get through that. I see that stuff climbing up the side of houses. Yeah. Anyway, as crawl spaces may be, you know, vapor barrier is basically non-existent. Right. This is just one section of that HVAC system. Right on the ground. How long has that been there? Before they moved in. So the thinking is it's rusted out the bottom and sucking in there? That material is not rated for ground contact. Nothing is sealed. Nothing is sealed. Nothing. No. I have seen a whole system sitting on the ground. You can't do that. 
I know. It's just, I turn the thing. It sometimes like this filter supposedly from the landlord. What the landlord told my client was changed a month prior to me looking at it. The cuds are growing up over the door. Yeah. Yeah. What about some That's your Combustion pen. Oh, there you are. That's a connection to the chimney. Mm -hmm. That was done during the summer when this was tested. So, how long have they lived there? Six months. Six months. So, they had lived through a heating system. Crap. And the worst part of it is, is that my clients are Brazilian. They speak broken English. Portuguese is their main language. I mean, they're somewhat well versed in this, but they got taken in by this landlord that made them not pay them. They signed a two year lease unconditioned. Oh, oh man. And they were trying to get out of it, and the landlord was telling these people, sure, we want the remaining of all the monthly bills paid up. That looks like that whole thing. Well, you've got a single wall going in the basement, which is right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is a um, this is a connection point in the water. What he's saying is that this is all single wall then. Yeah. It's not a B then. <coughs> Double wall. So they're they're gonna have to go down this whole site and run a separate pipe on the yeah. Alright, we got a house that was built in 1967. <laughs> See this section of pipe out back here? It's a splice connection. What's the chance that this 50 year old pipe is laying in its own sewage? Good? Which is oh, outbound. That's outbound. Right you can tell it's in. See a connection like this? Especially when it looks like the soil is damp underneath of it? you got to know there's a leak underneath it. Oh, he can't see all at all. Do you know what the outcome of this one was when you're talking about having the... They were going to take this guy to court. And see, I, I, was a, I don't mind representing people like these are good people. And you feel for them. You feel like, damn, I hate seeing them being taken like this by a landlord that all he's concerned about is this. Just bugs the living dickens out of me. So... Yeah. Yeah. I have seen that too. Yeah. Not too bad. Again, this is suspicious. No, right? This is the least of their problems. Not as bad as mine. So where does that place us all in here in the realm of doing mold inspections? You're still gonna need to test this for mold. But to me, you test it after everything's been cleaned up. Well, the, to speak for the other guys who have done the tour, the primary thing that we were looking for uh, when we did, because obviously it's like this, it's a swab test. You don't do air testing. Right, right, you do swab. You do a swab test. It's basically to, uh, for the lab to determine if this is a, an element with a root base to it. So that is that effect class for him and that depends upon the, the right. type of cleaning element or cleaning process that the the qualified remediation contractor is to use. And of course, our we're not in the position to tell them what to do, but to provide the information for the qualified contractor to come in to see what he's got. If there's a root base element to it, if he has to do um, uh, hard scrub, uh, soda blast, whatever the whatever the process would be right. for, for cleaning. 
And that, you know, that's not what we, we do. We're, and again, you're, you're providing them uh, information to let them know that there's a condition here that requires the next level of attack. And that's with a qualified contract. Well, you know, mold remediation companies yeah. won't even touch this. Right, exactly. That's not their Because you're looking at theirs. you're looking at hazmat. That's it. You're, you're, looking, at, you're looking at black water issues <coughs> as opposed to because uh, this is this is a VOC problem. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got sewer gas coming out. No, I didn't smell any. Yeah, I have seen HVAC units on crawl space where you can barely get through when they dug a hole down in the crawl space and put it in the holes. Yeah. Now let me let me cl clear that last statement. I didn't smell any going into the house. Now I was wearing an N100 mask when I went into that crawl space. There's no way I'm getting in that crawl space with you know, just my nose. Come on, your lungs are great going. Yeah. Right. Well, there's N95 masks. It's a cloth mask. They're not worth a darn. And again, building out boulders. You really have to go with the N100 or PPE, you know, personal uh, positive pressure protection when you get into a situation like this. I got it in the truck. Yeah. So who do you call first in a situation like this? Mm. You got to call somebody that's expert in, in mm -hmm. this type of contamination because, again, like I said, even the the best bowl contractors, they're going to refer this work out. Well, you call first the attorney because from that point forward, it belongs to the homeowner or the, or the landlord in this case. Uh, and how he attacks it then becomes another issue in itself. Right. But I mean, if you just think of it from a suggestive standpoint, uh, I certainly would want to yeah, know about the uh, cast iron pipe and what its leakage issue is and getting that addressed before you then start dealing with the other element with the fungal growth that's in place in the car. Right. Well, a plumber wouldn't be a bad choice to get involved start in this, with. too. And first off, you know, your first point of attack. But the cleanup portion of it is the other thing. And I found a number of other things in the attic that we didn't even discuss in here, too. Roof leaks, chimney was leaking, active water leaks coming down from the chimney in the, in the interior of the house. I mean, who knows how much mold was inside this house? And, but again, the aspergillus and penicillium, I think, were coming from the crawl space. That's where it was started. That's the origination. One of the most common that you find. It's the most common? Penicillium. This penicillium is probably one of the most common. It is the most common of all of them, by far. Yeah. That's still in that cast iron summit over a period of time. That oak and patch and leaves. Oh, you should see the other Every photos. Time I do an inspection, that's what I look for. Right, right. And you'll see a bleed off uh, indicator on some of those too. I went ahead, I took probably a hundred pictures of this house from the attic down to the crawl space, and I gave them all to my client. I said, look, you, you know, if you want to take this to small claims, that's probably your best choice, but if you hire an attorney, you're talking about limiting what you can get back. You're spending money on legal fees and not being able, uh, and you got to really cut your losses and get out of this place. I mean, it's for your own good. And I kind of let it go at that. Now, I have yet to be contacted by any professional or back from them on this thing, so unfortunately, I don't know what's happening with us. particular case. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've all seen it. Sloppy work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I don't know, Richard, we got want to do some Q&A right now before we get into this. Um, any questions? Yes. Tell me again how the lab did their job properly if there was well, the elevated conditions are strictly guided by the pathologist of the lab. He's the one that makes the call. The, the uh, med techs don't have a say so. It's the, it's the standard of operation that the laboratory has. 
Again, each laboratory has its own set of standards. Your normal ranges and your non-elevated conditions can be different from one lab to the next. I could send this off to another lab and they may say, wait a minute, we've got an elevated condition. I, I couldn't tell you. One of the things to remember here is that the EPA nor ASHRAE provide what's classified acceptable levels. No, there is there is no parameter. Not elevated or elevated. Right. There, there is nothing to say. Okay, at this number it's okay, but at this number it's not okay. They're, I mean, they're they many think that if, you know, they're not going. They don't do that. Well, yeah. like, they talk about radon. <laughs> yeah, that's another. Element. That's that's pretty. That's pretty descriptive. Yes, sir. So like the last picture, the joystick had suspicious on it. Yes. Did you swap that to the engineer? Any amount that's acceptable? I mean, we just said it's like that there's no it's standard. It's present. But is there any sort of mold that is okay to be in the crawl space? Or well, if you're seeing anything propagate, that's a problem. Um, when you start disturbing mold, it's just like lead paint. You're creating aerosols. If you clean, you scrub, you heat, you scrape, you sand, you know, you're creating a, a, a hostile condition for your lungs. <laughs> Plain and simple. And we're getting back to the small particles. You, you're creating particles that are 50 microns all the way down to 0.3 microns. And it's the uh, size particle that's less than two and a half that are the most detrimental to it in the body. So, so, so if you see something like this, you know, something comes back elevated with mold. Your recommendation for the client is it going to be remediated mm -hmm. or is it going to be? If it's just stuff? as simple as this, and there's not any of the other stuff that's down in there, you know. Right. Now, there are a number of agents on the market, and most of which that are popular are the oxidants. Basically, they're hydrogen peroxide. So, what's, what happens with that product, what it does, and it has the least collateral damage effort, is that it burns off the extra molecule. The O2, it's H2O2. It burns off that so you're left with water. When you dry it out, everything's cold, right with the room. Then you come back and put a, uh, uh, you spray on a borate material. Uh, borate is uh, an alkaline product that changes the pH of the surface and makes it inhospitable for new growth. So that's kind of the role a lot of these companies are going there and spray and go with these types of situations. If it's as simple as that. But keep in mind, you have to control the moisture level down there first. Because all the money you spend on product and sprays and labor and all the other stuff is for not. Anything else? Yes, So Sandy, you just mentioned what to protect your clients' uh, expenditures, maybe not charge them if you didn't need to. Um, my philosophy has kind of been sometimes with the agents fighting back and forth, the client needs some leverage so that the listing agent takes it seriously. Like right. we can say, oh yeah, you got something that needs to be treated maybe, but then the listing agent's like, oh, I'll get the handyman with the bucket full of bleach down there and I'll be fine. Whereas if you have a lab report that's confirmed the presence of mold, then they tend to take that a little more seriously and a little more sure. receptive to the idea that, hey, this needs a professional remediation. That's the value I see that we provide the clients by charging for the test. Am right, I, I get your point. Am I off on that at all? That, that's a valid point, but you have, also have to remember is, if you do a test before and you do remediation but don't do a test after, you have an open-ended problem. We always recommend that hasn't been closed. Test. Always, yeah. You got to test. You got to do a post-testing. Same with radar. Same with radar. Oh, yep. yep. You need to understand about how post-tests are, are conducted because they're not exactly like an assessment on the front side. For example, in a crawl space like this, while you would do a swab or an assessment on a post-test, it fundamentally is visual uh, because post-tests typically are not re-swabbed again. They're determined by a visual uh, evaluation is if conditions look to have been addressed. I mean, that's really all you can do. I mean, they, at least that's the process that we went through. Right. Uh, when, it, when you're dealing with, an, with a living space, then it's a different animal. We're dealing with air sampling, determining what particular it is remaining within the atmosphere of the home. Uh, but in crawl spaces, uh, or non-livable spaces, you don't. It's, it's a visual application, it's a visual inspection. 
and you see everything under the sun. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. We can get to your point about when you walk into a, a house and all of a sudden you smell this putrid air. You start. You, you, you automatically have to put the red flag up and say this a suspicious microbial problem. You need to have it out. Yeah. Yeah, it can be if it's in right concentrations. Absolutely. Anything else? Yes. So how long after remediation is the test? I would recommend after intensity humidification. Because once you spray on the product, or once you apply whatever cleaning agents that are going to be applied, you've got to dry it off. Because remember, the byproduct of the cleaning agents is water. You cannot leave any environment for new growth. Um, uh, if you have the right dehumidification equipment, if you're looking at some of these industrial style dehumidifiers, and Sam Young's got a big one too, I don't know if you've ever seen his. Um, he'll go in and he'll set it up and in one to three days it's dry. I mean you can't even make spit in this house. <laughs> it's so dry. He'll get the he'll get the humidity levels down to fifteen percent. But that's what the ultimate equipment, but just generally speaking, what would you say? There's a protocol for it. For when this is based upon the, the processes when when the few of us who did it who an environmentalist. Uh, Typically, depending upon if you're in, within a living space, uh, the remediator comes through, he's done his dehumidification, he's done his process with his HEPA vax, he's done his cleaning. The idea is that you don't, we didn't test, or weren't, well, we did test, but it was depending upon what the inspector says. Typically, it has to sit for at least 24 to 48 hours in order for things to settle. At that point, and then that's a good point on particulate do, loads then in you, the house. You, then you come back and do your do your post testing. But right. if you're looking to do this type of things, you got to get training on it. You can't. Well, you can buy the swabs. Done. You can buy the air samples. You can buy the pumps. And uh, then what you're doing, you're buying trouble if you don't get through the process of the training on this. Okay. To your point about particulate loads, and that's a good point because in addition to dehumidifying the house, you have to HEPA scrub the environment. Let's say inside of a house that you've got a global problem, it's been cleaned up, you have to put a HEPA scrubber in there. You've got to remove all that fine particle because a lot of the uh, destroyed mold products is not just the spores, it's the hyphae, bay, it's the non-viable uh, non stuff that comes in fragments. That's what this is. It is. There's smuts. Didn't have any here. What you want to see is a low count on that. Let's say the report comes back at, you know, non-elevated. And but yet you've got an abundance of smuts, and the smuts doesn't elevate the, the the result. This is something that we all have to interpret. I know GIHs and other CIEs that will not pass a post-testing until that smut level is down below a certain amount. So now you're required to go in and do more HEPA scrubbing and come back on another date and, you know, a day or two and come back and retest again. So I'm thinking, to your point, doing at least two days of HEPA scrubbing and dehumidification. And then you got the duct work. And you got the, all that, it's all in there. I mean, you're if you animals. disturb it, you're you're creating aerosols. When it comes on, it's going to be disturbed. What what type of aerosol were you using? Just a regular aerosol? Mm -hmm. use regular aerosols. Fifteen by ten. Fifteen by ten. Okay. We use we use the fives. What we use right. which is a little shorter. Well, what I found, uh, the, the folks at ProLab had told me, the blotter on the aerosol is bigger. Yeah. Good. So when they look at frames, they're looking at uh, well, they call them zones now, but my wife called them frames where you'll, you'll, you'll set the, the intensity of the, mic, uh, of the magnification at a point where you can go from one frame to another. 
the aerosol has a larger, yeah, a larger, has larger much blotter. larger blotter face to it. Typically when we did them, uh, we would uh, actually turn the blower fan on the, on the HVAC unit and take a draw off the supply vent. And if, if you had done it in that capacity, I mean, what you did was fine. There's nothing wrong with that. No. You probably would have had a, had a gone out the roof. Yeah. Uh, I was afraid of afraid. Instead of 270, you probably had 270,000. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when, like I say, as soon as you move air and it's particulate loaded, yeah. you're going to see a different result here. So, right. anyway, thank you very much, folks.